G'day, so today's video is all about sleep optimization. Now, as a physiotherapist, one of the things that I see every day with my patients, we don't necessarily understand the impact that poor sleep quality could be having on your broader life in terms of your general health, your function, and your well-being. And for me as a physiotherapist, we know that poor sleep can have a huge impact on your body's ability to heal, your mental health, and even your pain intensity and duration. So it goes without saying that anything that you can implement to optimize and improve your sleep quality and duration, could go a long way to helping you build a better version of yourself and help you overcome anything that you might be dealing with physically. So in this video, I wanna go through 14 things that you can try that will hopefully help optimize your sleep duration and sleep quality to help you better recover from injury, dysfunction, pain, or even just improve your day-to-day -day general health and well-being. And this video is made possible in part by the Ringcon Smart Ring, but more on that in a little bit. So before we get into these tips, it's really important to frame sleep a certain way just so that you can better understand why each of these these tips may be important and useful for you because if I can give better meaning to them then it might register and resonate with you a little bit more. So there's obviously a lot of complicated processes that happen with your brain and body during sleep but ultimately all sleep is is just a balance of your central nervous system. Sleep is very much an important part of what's called your circadian rhythm which is your body's 24-hour internal body clock that essentially dictates time to be asleep and time to be awake. So most of these tips center around ways to optimize your ability to normalize that circadian rhythm and just allow your body to do what it's designed to do best. So the first tip is to make your room dark. This is potentially the most obvious. As daylight fades, your body realizes that it's time to start those processes that relate to going to sleep. So any light at all, whether it be outside lights, light from an alarm clock, a smartphone or anything like that, can subdue your body's ability to recognize that it's time to go to sleep. One thing we don't realize is that our skin is one of the biggest organs in the body and it's a light sensitive organ. Even if there's just a little bit of light shining in onto your skin, it may trick your body into thinking that it isn't actually time to fully be asleep to the best of its ability. So Investing in something like blackout curtains, like they do in hotels and motels, might just allow you to optimize your environment just that little bit more to prompt you to have a better night's sleep. Following on from this, also consider getting yourself an eye mask. Much like blackout curtains, the darker you can make your body feel it is around you, the more likely it is to be able to do the thing that it's trying to do when you're asleep. And in a similar vein to blackout curtains and an eye mask, consider wearing earplugs as well. If we're trying to block out any unnatural light from the outside with blackout curtains, and potentially on the inside, with a mask, we can take the same approach with earplugs to try and block out any unnecessary noise. Noises from outside traffic or noisy neighbours, or even if you live with someone who's watching TV or listening to music while you're trying to get to sleep, earplugs can be a very natural way to try and prompt your body to feel like there's less stimulation going on, giving it a better chance to try and do what it needs to do to help you sleep more effectively. The fourth thing to consider is to make sure that the temperature of your bedroom sits around about 15 to 20 degrees Celsius or 60 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit. As the sun goes down, the temperature naturally drops with it. So if the temperature of your bedroom doesn't reflect that, again, it can mess with that circadian rhythm where your body's expecting something to happen naturally that isn't happening. Tip number five is that you want to consider tracking your sleep. It's one thing to put these tips into place, but it's hard to know what effect they're ultimately having unless you track what's actually going on. And as I mentioned at the top of the video, this is where something like the Ringcon Smart Ring might help you specifically. If you've been paying attention to the channel over the last few weeks, you'll notice that I've been wearing the Ringcon Smart Ring to test out what it can do and what it can track for me in terms of sleep and other things. And when Ringcon reached out to me for a collaboration, I was really excited because for a long time, I've never been able to track my sleep. I don't like wearing a watch to bed, but something as convenient as a ring that just sits on my finger, it doesn't get in the way, has really allowed me to better understand what's actually going on when I'm sleeping. And truth be told, it was actually fantastic timing when this ring arrived. My family and I were about to embark on a three-week trip up to the Gold Coast in Australia to visit the main theme parks with my brother and his family before spending about a week camping with some other friends. So I was really interested to track what was going on with my sleep, my stress, my activity in terms of steps and calories, just to get an insight into obviously how stressed I felt, how I was sleeping, but also how much my body was or was not moving. The Ringcon Smart Ring comes with an app, which allowed me to track in real time a lot of these different metrics. So with any wearable technology, it's really important to understand that the readings and the metrics that they give aren't absolute, but they're a fantastic guide as to what might be 
happening underneath the surface. And if you can pair that data up with the context of how you feel day to day, then you can pick up on any important trends or features that might be going on that you wouldn't realize if you weren't tracking it with something like the Rincon Smart Ring. Now taking a look at my most recent night's sleep, the first thing that stands out to me is my sleep score. This sleep score factors in things like time I spent asleep, my heart rate, my body temperature, my time awake and things like that. Again, it's a nice easy way to get a strong sense of how my sleep is going. Now, if you compare this to a few days earlier when I was camping with some friends, sheepishly, you'll see that my sleep score was a dismal 30 out of 100. Truth be told, there was a lot of responsible alcohol consumption involved. I had a late night. I didn't get to sleep until the early hours of the next day. As you can see, I had about four hours sleep in total. And upon waking, I felt crap. Now, obviously, I didn't need the Rincon app to tell me that, but it's good to see how dismal that sleep was and pair it up with how bad I felt the next day. So coming back to last night's sleep, you'll see that I had a great sleep, almost eight hours, with more than two hours of that deeper restorative sleep. And on top of this, you can see the other metrics that's taken at the same time. I can see that my average heart rate for that sleep was about 59. My sleeping heart rate variability was about 38. And my blood oxygen levels and my oxygen saturation was at about 91%. And it's probably something for me to look into down the track. And while these numbers may not mean anything to you on the surface, when comparing them to age-related norms, I can see that my sleeping heart rate is a little higher than someone of my age, and my heart rate variability is a little too low. Now, this may mean something, it may not, but it gives me a starting point that I can use to measure up against going down the track as I begin to try and re-optimize my sleep again, my exercise habits, and my stress levels. So while these numbers aren't necessarily ideal for someone who identifies as a fit, healthy adult, it does give me that baseline that I can come back to in 4, 6, 12, weeks once I feel like my routines and my habits have improved again to see whether I've made any tangible objective observable changes with my sleep and other things. As an aside, that stress that I mentioned that I've also been dealing with, as I'm sure a lot of you have at home, the ring was able to give me a general understanding of when my stressful moments are throughout the day. I played Fortnite with my son the other day, felt very stressed during. I went fishing with a mate, for some reason that made me feel very stressed as well. And I was able to pair up how I felt in the moments with what the ring was telling me. And in terms of some of the other features that the ring possesses, it's water resistant to 50 meters, which is very convenient because one of the main theme parks that we visited up on the Gold Coast was a place called Wet n Wild. And what was also really convenient being away from home for those three weeks is that the battery life on this ring lasts up to seven days. But more importantly, it also comes with a charging case that when fully charged, can recharge your ring up to 18 times, totaling over 150 days worth of use before you need to plug this back into the wall and recharge it with electricity. So if you're trying to optimize your sleep quality and sleep duration, consider tracking your sleep and other things with a Rincon Smart Ring. I'm gonna to continue to keep wearing this for the next few months just to see what happens to my sleep and stress and activity levels over that period of time. So if you'd like me to talk about the results in another video down the track, please let me know in the comments down below. So tip number six revolves around limiting caffeinated drinks in the afternoon. So the poster child for caffeination is clearly coffee, but please don't forget that many teas, soft drinks, and energy drinks also have amounts of caffeine within them. And the reason why this is important is because it's understood that the effects of caffeine can last between six to eight hours depending on the person. So it goes without saying that if you consume caffeinated drinks within six to eight hours before going to bed, then that stimulating effect could be interrupting and affecting the quality of your sleep and its duration. Following on from caffeine, tip number seven revolves around limiting alcohol consumption. Studies like this one show that while alcohol can help improve your ability to fall asleep, it can destroy your sleep quality. This study took 4,000 people and looked at differing degrees of alcohol consumption on sleep quality. They found that low alcohol consumption related to a 9% decrease in sleep quality, moderate alcohol consumption related to a 24% decrease in sleep quality, and high alcohol consumption related to a 30 9% decrease in sleep quality. So if we take my two sleep scores into account from before, I'll let you decipher what that means in terms of my night out. Another hugely important thing to factor into your quest to optimize your sleep duration and quality is the effect of technology. More specifically, what we're looking for is the effects of blue light on your melatonin levels. Coming back to that circadian rhythm and your body's ability to know when it's time to downregulate and dump into that sleep cycle, unnatural light from technologies like phones, iPads, computers, and TVs has the ability to interfere with melatonin, one of the things that prompts your body to unwind and prepare for sleep. Thankfully, most phones, laptops, and iPads now have the ability to equip a blue light filter that you can set from 
from sunrise to sunset, if not a little bit either side of that, to make sure that you're not unnecessarily exposing yourself to more light than you should be when it's time to go to sleep. Blue light filters do change the color of your screen to a more reddish tone. So if the color of your screen is really important and those natural filters don't work with you, then maybe consider something like blue light glasses instead to try and optimize that experience. Now, instead of just trying to optimize the sleep experience itself, tip number nine revolves around making sure that you accumulate enough exercise throughout the day before your head hits that pillow. If you're someone who struggles to fall asleep and you can look back throughout the course of your day and see that you haven't necessarily accumulated enough movement in that day, then you may not have accumulated enough movement debt to prompt your body to fall asleep to recover from that activity. Any device that measures your steps throughout the day can be a good trackable metric to understand how much activity you might be getting versus how much you might need to be getting day to day. Anything above 8,000 steps is a great amount of activity to strive for. But if you're looking for one of the easiest things that you can do today to improve your sleep as a whole, then try doing a little bit more during the day and see what effect that has on you. Tip number 10, get outside and get some sunlight. Much like using a blue light filter, where we're trying to remove as much abnormal light in the moments that your body needs to downregulate and prompt you towards sleep, it's equally as important to get some actual daylight and sunlight onto your face and body during the day to tell your body that it is daytime. If you're someone who struggles to go to sleep at night, again, it could be because you didn't actually get outside enough to provide that contrast for your nervous system to realize what's going on. But get a little sunshine and see what happens. Tip number 11 involves practicing some deep breathing before getting into bed. As I mentioned right at the top of the video, sleep in a way is a balance between your nervous system's ability to upregulate and downregulate. And because sleep is our restorative phase, we really need to be in a parasympathetic or downregulated state to optimize that experience. And what we're coming to understand a lot more is that deep breathing can be a very strong avenue to downregulating a heightened nervous system, potentially better preparing your body to fall asleep and optimize that sleep experience. So what you can do is just relaxing down. Something like box breathing can be quite effective where it could be a five second inhale. The five second pause at the top. The five second exhale. With a five second pause at the bottom before repeating that cycle. And what you might find is after doing a few of these in a row, potentially five to 10, you might feel genuinely a little bit more relaxed and a little bit more able to fall asleep. Another strategy that you can try is investing in a weighted blanket. Admittedly, there isn't a large number of studies that look into the benefits of weighted blankets, but the idea is, is that the weight of that blanket can help tap into that parasympathetic nervous system that we just spoke about, helping your body feel more safe, less anxious, and ultimately more relaxed, better allowing you to dump into that sleep cycle more effectively. Something a little bit more left of center that you can try is the affectionately called gut smash. It requires you to take a medium sized soft ball and gently let it press into your abdominal wall. The idea behind this is it can help stimulate that vagus nerve, which again can be another avenue to downregulating and destimulating a heightened nervous system. Moving the ball around until you find something that feels a little bit tight and restricted, taking a deep breath into the ball. Then giving that tight musculature a bit of a squeeze for five to 10 seconds. And when you relax, it'll give a little bit and you can just hunt around that abdominal wall within the boundaries of the bottom of your rib cage, all the way down to sort of towards the top of your pelvis, looking for anything that feels tight or restricted. We spend a lot of time trying to mobilize our tissue at the back, but we often neglect the tissue in the abdominal wall, especially when we're trying to downregulate and relax. And the final tip that I'd like to go through is potentially one of my favorites, is that a great time to do your soft tissue mobility work is in the evening or the time before you go to bed. If you're someone who has some tight spots through your hips, through your glutes, through your legs, anywhere throughout your body, spend some time gently rolling around on them, giving them a squeeze, relaxing, letting them give, giving them another squeeze, letting them relax, pinning the ball down, trying to gently create some active motion over the top to shear free some of that tightness down low. Not only can this optimize the function of your body by increasing the mobility and the tissue quality of that area, but it can also stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system again to downregulate, ultimately improving your body's ability 
to prepare itself for sleep. And because poor sleep quality can potentially be linked to poor healing and increased pain, not only can soft tissue mobility work help with that from a mechanical and a, and a physiotherapy perspective, but it can also help by improving and optimizing your sleep at the same time. So I genuinely hope that any number of those tips help optimize and improve your sleep quality and duration. Let me know in the comments down below which one you found the most helpful for you. Thank you again to RingCon for sending me this ring and allowing me to test it out for myself. But I genuinely hope those tips were helpful and I hope to see you next time. Bye.